Hello, welcome to uh, DCTB.TV from the Republica in Berlin. My name is Philip Banzer and we are talking now about a very innovative form of journalism. It's called immersive journalism and the next guest is James Pello. Welcome to the program, James. Thank you, glad to be here. So, uh, you're from the Emblematic Group and uh, your talk is and wa was about uh, immersive journalism. Wh what is it exactly? Uh, it's a new kind of media. I would call it a transmedia genre. It's a, a way where we take elements from different media like traditional journalism and documentary filmmaking, but also video games and movies like CGI. And we bring these elements together to create a new kind of hybrid that is capable of telling stories in a, a very pow a, ne a unique, new kind of powerful way where we immerse you in the scene. And we just want to show an example that mm -hmm. shows very well what you're talking about. Yep. So just give us a brief idea of what we're going to see right okay. now. So this is the, a piece about the shooting of Trayvon Martin, the African-American guy that was uh, shot and killed by a neighborhood watch volunteer in Florida. Um, it's a recreation of the events around the shooting. I, nobody knows exactly what happened. We, we, don't, we don't have a uh, documentary evidence of exactly what happened. But we took a lot of existing elements, like, for example, security camera footage um, from a convenience store where Trayvon was before the incident. We have the recordings of the phone calls to the police, the 911 calls. So we can hear George Zimmerman on the phone to the police when he first spots Trayvon. Yeah, you know. we just play the piece, and you, sure. you, you um, and so, uh, so this is obviously a computer-generated video. Yes, this is a, a rendering of the condominium complex where the where the events took place. Um, so that's that's you know. It's real in the sense that it's built on 3D rendering, mod architectural models of the actual complex. So it's, it's realistic in that level. And the sound we hear? The sound is the actual sound. Okay, this is a tape made first by George Zimmerman calling the police. And the, 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 the incredible piece here is that at the end, he calls in and he says, I see, this, I see this suspicious guy, he's wandering around, what shall I do? Da, da, da. And at the end he says, you know, he's, he's, he's running away, you know, and the, pol and the policeman on the other end of the line says, are you following him? And George says, yes. Again, kind sound. Uh, we don't have sound. It's, it's muted. I don't know why. No. Uh, it's muted. I don't know. It's locked somehow. Okay, so we, we, don't, we don't have sound. Okay. Okay. So let it run. So um, anyway. So okay. But we we can imagine hearing like uh, phone calls, uh, security guy calling in. The George Zimmerman, who's the the man that shot and killed Trayvon, calls the police, and he describes a suspicious man lurking in the complex and, and moving oh, we around. We see here walking around, right? We see him just in the distance, kind of shadowy. And at the end of the call, uh, you hear the policeman say, "Are you following him?" And George Zimmerman says, yes, I am. And the policeman says, we don't need you to do that. So it's very clear. You hear that exchange that he, he was told he didn't, didn't need to follow. And then we cut from there to um, the inside of various apartment, uh, apartments in the complex. And again, this is all based on actual recorded audio of calls to the police. So various people say, I'm hearing some struggling. There's some commotion going on outside. And then at some point, you hear gunshots. Um, and then you, you hear some response after the shots are being fired. So, and this scene right now is inside where? It's inside one of the apartments in the housing complex. This is a couple that were hearing what was going on outside and they called the police to say, hey, we hear some commotion. Okay, and cut to the next scene. Two more condos also in the complex. Experiencing yes. the same amount, Ex exactly, place, exactly. time. So we've, we've stitched together the timeline of events all based on calls, the 911 calls to the police. Okay? okay. First with George and Trayvon and then from these three different apartments within the complex. And the apartments and the interior is also based on, 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 yeah. on well reality? This is the amazing thing that uh, so much of these materials now are sort of open source or widely available. So you can get architectural models of the complex on the internet, both of the exteriors and the interiors. So we know that this is actually, you know, it's accurate. You can't say strictly speaking that it's real because it's it, we built it in CG, 
but it's accurate. It really reflects what the place looks like and feels like. Um, and similarly, the c there's a, in the early scene, you see George sitting in his car. Um, you can go onto the internet now and find uh, 3D renderings of pretty much every car on the market, and you can buy them for a couple of hundred bucks and pull it down. So they, the tools to make these pieces uh, in many ways are becoming more widely available. It's a more plug and play experience. Okay, and now we cut back to the outside and see what? Ah, uh, this is the that's final. That's the pretty much already. it. Then we, get, then, we go, then we go to the <coughs> ending. So <coughs> this was really just, until this point, most of the pieces we built, I mean, Noni de la Pena, who founded the company, she's been doing this for eight years, since way before anyone even really knew what, well, what virtual reality was, or certainly they had the idea of doing journalism in VR. A lot of people early on were like, this, you're crazy, you can't do this. This is, this is like for video games. You can't, you can't tell news stories. But she's a pioneer, she persevered. Um, and because no one else was doing it, she essentially made her own hardware. So she was telling the stories, but also physically building the headsets so that you could experience the things. The Trayvon <coughs> is, um is new for us because we built it so that it could be experienced on the um, Samsung Gear VR headset or on Google Cardboard. Yeah. So we're making our content more widely available to a wider audience. Okay, we, we have a video here. I don't know if we can see it. Uh, Lena, can we see it? Okay, so th th in this video, um, BuzzFeed did a tour through your Yes, this is your lab. This is yes. And we can see uh, some of the hardware you are working with. Right, so this is our proprietary hardware. We have these motion capture sensors you can see all around the room. And they track the, the head-mounted display that you're wearing, a helmet with antennae on top. So in this piece, it's a much more fully immersive experience because as you move, the world moves around you. Okay, but you have to be in this lab. Yes. Well, we can we can in we can install this many places, but y you have to be at an event or some place where we've set up. So, and the I, experience. as a user, have to be within this yes. environment yes. to experience this yes. kind of yes. So we've shown these pieces, for example, at the Sundance Film Festival, at South by Southwest, at the Tribeca Film Festival, at Davos. We had a piece commissioned by the World Economic Forum last year to show at Davos or, for example, in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It's, a, it's an, an installation that you have to go and to. And what, what is he doing right now there? Okay, so this piece, what happened here, the piece was built on two pieces of documentary footage captured on cell phone. Uh, one person had it captured from the ground floor. One person captured the scene from above on a balcony. And the scene is of a man being essentially beaten to death by US border guards. It's a, it, it's a, a terrible event. The person... Uh, Filming from above, her phone was running out of power. So she only had 60 seconds left to record. So what we did to try and make this piece illustrative and, and sort of instructive about this, we, we built in a kind of a gaming element. So you carry this phone with the antennae on top, and you have to choose your 60 seconds of when you film to try and get the best testimony okay, okay. to capture what had happened. So it's a, almost like putting a bit of a video game element into this documentary Piece of okay. Reporting. So, in the in the goggles, yep. you see the world around you. Yes. Which is generated by you and computers based on video footage captured at the scene. Yes. Yes. And then you have this gaming element, like okay, you have this smartphone device yep. in your hand. Yep. And you have you ha you have to capture sixty seconds exactly. of video. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And why do you need all this hardware? Why do we have to be in there to, 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 to actually experience well, this kind of Well, there are two story. reasons. Um, this was an earlier piece, right? This was shown um, at, at 2014 at the, at the Tribeca Film Festival. At this point, no one else was making the hardware that ah. we needed to tell the story. So we, we've been making our own hardware. We don't want to make our own hardware, but we have to because no one else is making what we need, right? So that's one thing. But the second thing is, um, it is a more immersive kind of experience. When you come to one of our full setup installations, right, and you put on these sort of hi these high-end goggles, you f you feel more physically present at the scene. Because as you walk, for example, if I'm talking to you right now, yeah. you know, if I were to walk around, I could walk away from you, or I could come back closer. So the world reacts to my movements. A lot of what you is called VR, but rather that you see now in the in the smaller headsets. 
you're not, you can't move around like that. You can see around you a 360 degree field, but if you move, the world moves with you, yeah. right? So it's a bit of a conundrum because if, if you want the full immersive experience, it's a bigger setup. But yeah. lately, Sony and Gear uh, and, and Steam yep. and others yep. uh, have, have presented goggles where they track your movement, not only the head, yes. the head movement, yes. but the movement of the whole yeah. body. Yeah, yeah. So you could move around in this virtual world. It's coming. It's I mean, coming. The, the, yeah. the advances in the hardware are astonishing. We see new stuff in our labs. Once a week, yeah. something comes in. We're like, wow, you know. So, but we uh, will be thrilled when someone else has figured out the hardware piece. Because, we, you know, we're journalists. We make content. We tell stories. We use the best available technology to do that. Um, and we keep adapting to the new, new equipment as it comes out to tell, hopefully, stronger and more powerful stories. So, again, we're not, you know, we don't, we don't want to make our own hardware. We've been doing that because... You yeah. were the, the, were the yeah. first to yeah. do it. Yeah. So... The pieces we saw, the advantage there is you can make a, a news story where there is practically no footage or no real... Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. No, or, or very, very little footage. Yep. And you only have uh, like some, I don't know, some evidence, some phone calls, some minor yep. pieces and yep. you can stitch yep. it together. Yep to a whole new world and to experience it yourself. Exactly. We actually we don't say stitch because stitch really means that's a term for 360 degree video and that's uh -huh. when you have several camera angles and you yeah, need to, to okay. meld them together. Technical term. But yes, we blend those kinds of elements. For example, we are we are working on a very big piece right now that's it's a first for us because we're working in partnership with a major news organization. We have a commission from Al Jazeera America to do a piece uh, called Death in Plain Sight. It's about domestic violence in, in South Carolina, in America and South Carolina. Um, and it's uh, an extension of a documentary they've already made about, a, about this domestic violence thing. And there's an incident in the documentary where a woman was shot and killed by her domestic partner in her house. And her sister was also present in the house. And the sister was already on the phone with the police as things started to unfold. So the entire sequence of events is caught on that audio. So, so here, yes, of course there's no video, but here we are essentially recreating that event based on the, 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 the real audio footage. And then we, are, we, we have photographs, for example, of the inside of the house, so we are rendering those in CG, which looks more and more realistic all the time. And then we're going to put those things together to create something that you know, helps to tell that story in a different way. Um, uh, it's, it's very hard to describe, but once you've put on such a VR goggle and you moved around yourself in such a VR environment, yeah. it's very hard to describe. But everyone, I did it myself, yeah. I know people who did yeah. it, yeah. and they're all like blown away from yeah. it. But I tried games, basically. Yeah, yeah. So how is it? Can you describe it? How is, how is it? What's the feeling? What's the... What's the the value of moving around in a recreated, uh, like real current real event world setup, situation. real world situation, <coughs> okay. w which is based by really f facts and news. Yeah. Okay, so the single um, most important feature of VR is what we call presence, right? So it's that the even though you know that you're here, you also your body is also really telling you that you're somewhere else. You feel like you're in two places at yeah. once, right? Um, we also call it embodiment. It's an embodied experience because you, you, you feel present on this scene. What we have found is that that presence generates a very strong emotional response. So people who come through these um, scenes, you know, we've had people come through with a piece about Syria, for example, that, that recreates an explosion on the streets of Aleppo. And part of it was a, a very well-known piece of video on YouTube. Ever, everyone has seen this footage. But we've had people come through the experience and they've seen the footage thousands of times. But when they are inside it, they have this new, stronger, empathic response. I mean, pe people come out literally in tears, you know, already shaken uh, and really moved. So it seems that VR has this power to, I guess, to move you in this powerful way. And so that, yeah. that is very interesting because um, this American life only, only I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, yep. did a piece about what make 
what makes people change their mind and and oh and, yeah. and their decision and 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 and, and their opinion and uh, they found out like based on statistic and science and everything it's not facts P no you cannot really right. convince people by facts and right. they will not change their mind for a longer period of time right uh, only based on facts and evidence right the cases where they found people really really changed their mind yeah. and their opinion about something was when they were experiencing something else when they're uh, like for example they had the, the example of a gay marriage people changed their mind for a really long period of time when they were told by gays who married uh, and told them about their personal experience sure then they then sure. the opposite side changed yeah. its mind yeah so and I think this is a very very profound argument for VR because yeah, I, yep if you if you grab people by their emotions then they really can change their mind exactly their, their opinion. but it, it's also a warning that we have to be very careful and use it very responsibly it's a powerful tool it can be used for propaganda like anything else it can be used for bad reasons as well as good reasons so uh, we've got to be absolutely sure that we're being responsible journalists we're telling the right stories we're not taking any liberties with the facts um, but you know I think we we're also what we're trying to do is help to set the best practices for what this medium will be it's going to be powerful we want to make sure it's powerful for the good reasons for the right reasons not for the wrong reasons but right now journalism is about getting the facts right now you have to take care that you get the emotions right that's very well put yeah and have you made any experience with that like what to do and what's not possible like um i don't know what's not possible i mean um in terms of what's not possible, that goes back to a more physical thing. For example, some people talk about experiencing nausea. They feel sick when yeah, they do the VR. Okay. I've seen some of those. Here's what you have to remember. And as, as, as Nonny has this phrase, your body is along for the ride. Okay, so your mind is thinking that you're really in this situation. So it has to be somewhere where you, you could potentially physically be. Yeah, I could be walking around on the street in Aleppo. But if suddenly the camera moves really fast or pans, or zooms, you know, in a way that's not like a human being could move. I'm taken out of my body and yeah. I start to feel nauseous. So that's one of the rules that we've learned of what you can't do is y you have to respect the body, respect the physical experience as if you're really, you're as if you're really there. Um, beyond that, on the more emotional level, no, look, we try, and we try and tell stories that are important, that touch on, you know, major issues. Uh, we try and... Uh, you know, bring awareness to stories that aren't very well known, that should be better known. And we're responsible in using the materials that we use to not, to not, um, you know, deviate from, from reality. But that's, that's it, yep. Um, I was wondering, because um, right now we talked about being in a, in a different environment, but can you, what happens if you can interact with your environment. We had this example like yep. take a 60 mm. minutes yeah. or a 60 seconds yep. video. Yep. Okay, this is a very basic kind of interaction. But have you tried out if like Aleppo, if you could talk to people, if you could move things around, if you can, could, I don't know, battle with a warrior and... Right, 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 right. We haven't done that yet, but it's uh. coming. Um, obviously we're working within the, the technical strength constraints of what can be, can be made right now. But yes, we certainly know, we, we know with, with the right resources, we know how, for example, you could be walking through an experience with one or two of your friends and you'd be aware that they were there and you could be sharing that experience together. And I think that's key because one, one of the things about VR right now is it's such a solitary, personal thing, right? You put on the goggles and you're, you're, it's very much you, you're immersed alone. But I think the next big step is going to be, yes, you can do it collaboratively or collectively with, you know, with your friends, with your family and, and be in this place. Together. And yes, look, there are all kinds of things, what we call haptic gloves that reflect the, mo the movement of your hands. And that'll be, you know, body armor if you want it. It'll be w w whatever you can imagine. And yes, you'll be able to interact with physical objects, with other people. Yeah, there's no end to where this can go. Uh, I just want to show you something because this is, I think this is the next step of, of VR. Um, I saw this on CBIT. Um, this is a, 
GoPros mounted ah, yeah. on, a, yep. on, a, on a simple tripod. Yep. And the cables, the video output, yep. goes to a, to a PC. On this PC runs a, a software called Video Stitch, mm -hmm. I think, video or Video yep. Stitch yep. Share. And this stitches the video together into a 360 video, right. which you can watch on a VR. Right. So if you, you can see it here yep, in the player. Yep, yep. Uh, th the audience is put at the place where the tripod stands and can look around. Mm -hmm. So if you put like this tripod with the cameras on a stage or <coughs> like <coughs> yep. on a street in, 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 in Aleppo, you could, and people put on their goggles mm -hmm. And they can move around and look around as if they were standing live on the street in Aleppo. Isn't that a thing you're, you're, you're <coughs> dealing with? <coughs> well, there's one crucial difference there, which is I would like to think that we're constructing narratives. Okay, we are telling you the story of an event. Um, so... <coughs> Yes, look, theoretically, you could have one of these cameras everywhere yeah. and you could choose to go to virtually go anywhere you wanted and see what's happening there. But yeah. well, then what's the point of going anywhere? Because it's unfiltered. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, it's sort of just a wash of information. Yeah, it's basically the, the, the equivalent um, to today's, I don't know, live events. You have exactly. this well-prepared... Mm large documentaries and you have this live events. <coughs> <We're> switching <coughs> live now to I don't know. Right. Location right. X Y Z. Right. The point is not that this raw material is there. It's how do you take that raw material and actually tell a story and involve someone and move them. Right? I think that's the difference. So we're gonna use three sixty video, no doubt, at some point. Um but it has to go beyond just hey, you know, here you are at the in the middle of the World Cup final. You know, great. Because what's the point of view? You know, what's the story? What's the, what's the angle? There's always going to be an angle. There's always going to be a narrative. Okay. And I think for us as, as journalists, that's the most important thing. So where do you see this going? What's the next? What's your vision? Um, our vision is that this will become part of the way in which a mainstream audience gets their news and information about what's going on in the world. I think every major news organization will start creating VR content. Um, we want to be, you know, a, 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 a big force and a big brand in that world. I think the goggles will get to a point where it's as, it's as comfortable and lightweight to slip on a pair of these goggles as today you put in your headphones to listen to music. So it'll, be, it'll become um, a, a basic part of your daily routine you don't even think about. VR will become a medium that's alongside newspapers and magazines and television of, of how you, you know, ha find out about what's going on in the world. I, I mean, mean, you yeah. can do it today already. You can. There are different frames for your smartphone. Yeah. Uh, you can put yep. your smartphone yeah. in. Yeah. And start a, a VR film on yep. your smartphone. Absolutely. Yeah. Feeling Google, is Google basically Google cardboard. Yeah. Google cardboard, for example, or. Uh, but that's going to get. I mean, we've seen in the lab. We've seen lenses that are with such amazing clarity and that is so light, you know, it's not going to take long for someone to put that into a really comfortable light headset that's that, that has 10 times the processing power of what's in your phone. I mean, look, Moore's Law, we know the technology just keeps getting more and more powerful. Yeah. Six years ago, when I saw one of Nani's first pieces in her lab in LA, it, it took a server, you know, the, the size of this desk to power that headset to walk around. Yeah, and now you can do it. With Almost, a smart with a more or less with a smartphone. It's only going to get better. More and are there already any mm. news organizations who use it really for current events? Uh, no one has gotten seriously into it yet, but we're talking to a lot of potential partners, like this piece we're doing with Al Jazeera, um, about helping them get down that road. So it's coming. It's coming right. soon. James, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, very interesting uh, stuff you're working on. I hope so. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks very much for working, uh, for watching. My name is Philip <laughs> Banza. <laughs> Keep on working. Keep working. <laughs> Keep on working. This was James Palo from um, Emblematic Group. Uh, we were talking about immersive journalism. Thanks very much for watching.